So we begin with immediate implant placement and ask the question, when immediate? And to be able to answer this question, we need to understand what the main risk is with immediate implant placement in the maxillary anterior region. And this has been identified now uh, through a, a number of consensus conferences and also through um, studies looking at aesthetic outcomes, that the main risk with immediate implant placement in the maxillary anterior region for single tooth replacements is recession of the mid facial mucosa. And it is uh, quite, a, um, quite a common occurrence, um, particularly in, in studies reporting on this um, about a decade ago before we really fully understood what the inclusion criteria should be for this. The risk factors associated with soft tissue recession with immediate implants are as follows. The first is the soft tissue phenotype. And what has clearly been demonstrated is that thin phenotype cases are at greater risk of soft tissue recession than thick phenotype cases. It doesn't mean to say that you cannot get recession with thick phenotype cases. It can still happen if the implant is in a, in a, in a malposition, for example, or if there's a, a, a dehiscence of the facial bone plate when the implant is placed and you get some recession. It can still happen, but the chances of recession are much, much greater with thin soft tissue phenotypes than they are with thick soft tissue phenotypes. So the case selection criteria for immediate implants, we try to look for cases that have a thicker soft tissue phenotype to minimize that risk. And secondly, we look at the bone phenotype. We know that if you select cases with a thin facial bone phenotype and compare that with a thick facial bone phenotype, the vertical or the coronoapical resorption can be up to three times greater in those thin bone types than in the thicker bone phenotypes. And of course, with a vertical resorption, the soft tissue loses its support, and that in turn can result in soft tissue um, recession. And the, um, really the cutoff between thin and thick today, most people will accept about one millimeter or more as being a thick phenotype, and anything less than one millimeter as being a thin phenotype. Of course, we also have to understand that the thin facial bone phenotype is the predominant phenotype in the maxillary anterior region. And that's why immediate implant placement in the anterior maxilla is, may not be applicable in the majority of cases simply because the bone phenotype tends to be relatively thin. The other aspect relating to the facial bone uh, wall of the socket is uh, its condition. Is the bone intact or has it been damaged by a fenestration or a dehiscence? And a study in 2007 published by Joe Can showed quite clearly that with a dehiscence of the facial bone, in other words, the facial bone is damaged, even with grafting and GBR procedures, there is a much, much greater chance of recession of the soft tissue within the first 12 months of implant placement. And the bigger the, the, the defect or the greater the damage to the facial bone wall, the greater the risk there is of soft tissue recession. So the inclusion criteria that we should adopt and, and recommend it is that we should select cases that have an intact facial bone rather than uh, cases which have damage to the facial bone. So the case selection criteria are pretty straightforward. And if we adopt these inclusion criteria that uh, have been recommended to us by the ITI, then we are in a position where we can place implants with a high degree of certainty of successful outcomes. So we want that thick tissue phenotype. We want that thick and intact facial bone plate. And we would like to, in these types of situations, adopt a flapless extraction and implant placement protocol because this further minimizes the trauma to the facial bone um, if we can avoid raising a flap to place the implant. How do we go about this? Well, the implant needs to be placed uh, very carefully in the correct three-dimensional position. And we need to maintain a gap of at least two millimeters between the implant, shoulder of the implant, and the facial bone wall. And the reason for this is that the graft that you then place into this region becomes the new facial bone wall. And it needs to be thick enough so that a provisional 
matrix can form, a blood clot followed by provisional matrix, and a new bone wall can form. If the gap is too small, then there is a lesser chance of, of regenerating a, a bone wall that's going to be thick enough to be uh, viable long term. So maintain a two millimeter gap as a minimum, graft it with a bone substitute that has a low substitution rate, and place the shoulder of the implant about half to one millimeters apical to the facial bone in order to compensate for some of the vertical resorption of the facial bone that will occur. And I reintroduce this histological image because this is really what tells us what goes on uh, with that facial bone. We need to have the implant placed deep enough to compensate for some of that vertical resorption. We need to have the implant placed far enough towards the palatal aspect to maintain that two millimeter bone wall so that that biomaterial that we use, our bone substitute, has the ability to regenerate that new facial bone wall, which ultimately supports the soft tissues. Now, there is Another aspect to this, the soft tissues themselves can collapse once a tooth is extracted because the tooth is no longer there. So with immediate implants, a variety of techniques have been described to try and support the soft tissues to stop that soft tissue support. And one way is to use a connective tissue graft, as you can see on these two images here. So connective tissue is harvested from the palate, the implant's placed, the graft is, is, is inserted into the buckle or the facial defect, and then a piece of connective tissue is used then to support the soft tissues. This is very effective. It's a very effective way of doing this, but of course it involves a second surgical site, which can sometimes be a bit uncomfortable for our patients. Another way um, has been described by um, Tanau and Chu and so on. And here is their, their so-called dual zone technique, which is quite an interesting technique. The grafting material they use within that facial defect is a fine particle grafting material, uh, usually um, an allograft, um, and the graft is placed not just to the level of the facial bone. The graft is placed all the way to the crest of the soft tissue. So the graft um, resides in the soft tissue zone. And the theory here is it becomes incorporated into a blood clot, which ultimately, the, of course it doesn't turn into bone, but it gets incorporated into the soft tissue and helps thicken the soft tissue. And certainly from the histological images that you can see on the right hand side uh, with the, um, the healing um, uh, af after conditioning of the soft tissues in that lower image, that's a substantial thickening of the soft tissue can be achieved this way. So, so this is a, another interesting technique to try and thicken up and support the soft tissues. Of course, the other method that is employed is to make use of a provisional prosthesis. So if you you can take the tooth out, place the implant, and connect a provisional prosthesis at the same time. And if all the conditions are favorable, then that provisional prosthesis helps to support the soft tissues as well, and therefore to enhance the overall um, aesthetic outcomes. So this is the so-called immediate implant, immediate restoration, or immediate um, loading protocol, or with the new classification system, the type 1A protocol. Obviously, to be able to place the implant and to be able to connect the provisional crown straight away, you must have a certain amount of stability. And it's recommended that, uh, depending upon the implant system, that the insertion torque of 25 to 40 Newton centimeters be achieved, or if you're using ISQ, then a value of greater than 70 should be achieved so that you have confidence then when the prosthesis is connected to the implant that it will not uh, move and, and disturb the osseointegration process. And of course, with these protocols, you need to have an occlusion that is favorable, that you can, that the provisional prosthesis can be protected. So the deep bite situations, for example, or patients who are not compliant, for example, who won't follow instructions. And these are situations where a type 1A approach or immediate implant and immediate restoration might not be the best way to proceed. Sometimes, however, it is, it is necessary to open a, a flap if you're attempting to place an implant immediately. And the flap is open to facilitate tooth extraction if you can't get access to the root either way, or if grafting is required to repair minor defects. And here I would stress there should only be minor defects, uh, and then the implant should be submerged and not immediately loaded because you want to maximize the regenerative potential on the implant and not to interfere with the regeneration of the bone, particularly in that critical coronal region of the implant shoulder. Uh, 
Of course, there is another reason why you might adopt a conventional loading protocol, which is also referred to as a type 1C conventional protocol, is that when the implants are placed, you cannot achieve that initial high stability that you want. In which case, if you were planning to do an immediate restoration protocol, you might have to abandon that if you don't get enough stability and revert back to a conventional loading protocol um, uh, to allow the implant to be to integrate without having any um, uh, occlusal forces or stresses on it that might disturb the integration, particularly when uh, the implant has not achieved a high degree of stability. So this is the same case. So the flap is open, the tooth is extracted, the implants placed immediately, and now we are doing the grafting, the GBR procedures to reconstruct the facial bone. And then the implant is completely submerged. So it's, it's essentially like an early implant placement, but uh, done with an immediate uh, approach. And then subsequently um, the uncovering procedures and the restorative procedures, and you can end up with a very good uh, aesthetic and functional outcome as well. So this is a variation, a type 1C. Rather than immediate loading, we're looking at the conventional loading protocol. So of course, when should we not place an implant immediately? Well, I think if there is acute infection in the site, it's really not a good idea to do this. You should take the tooth out, allow the area to heal before placing uh, the implant. Chronic infection, draining fistulas, that's very debatable. Some people feel comfortable, others don't. My take on this is that if there is a draining if there's a fistula, then there's damage to the facial bone somewhere, in which case I'd rather take the tooth out and allow the pathology to resolve before I come back and place the implant. For me, it's too great a risk that there we might have, a, have an infective issue which could then damage uh, the outcome of uh, the implant placement. We shouldn't place an implant immediately if there is damage to the facial bone, as we've mentioned earlier, and in the thin phenotype cases. So these, for me, are really strong contraindications for not placing uh, implants immediately. 